Good lunch and enjoyed the college tours. Uh, we're very excited to have George the Poet here, who's an alumni from King's, and who graduated five years ago in politics, psychology, and sociology. And he's just going to give you a little bit more information about what he's been doing since, the projects that he's been involved with, including an upcoming podcast called Have You Heard About George's Podcast? So, I have the stage over to you. Yeah, um, sure. Go for it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Um, so I was, just, I was just saying to some people outside, yesterday, five years ago, I did my second ever headline show, my own show. And um, a few days after that, in the same year, obviously, um, <laughs> I, I graduated. Then a couple of weeks after that, I signed my first record deal. But all of that activity was, had been building up by the, during my time here. So while I was here, when I first got here, I was a rapper. I'd been rapping since I was about 15 years old. In fact, I was an MC. I was doing grime. But um, I'd become bored and a little bit frustrated with grime because I felt like people are saying the same things. No one's really interested in. Everyone had new flows. There was always a new way of spitting or there was a new style of music, but there were no new ideas. And that annoyed me because I'm an ideas man. So when I got here, I kind of, my dreams of rapping or being a rapper were kind of dead in the water. But because the environment was so different from where I was from, I'm from Northwest London. Yeah, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm from Hars the North, North, Knees the Northwest London. Um, so this, this environment being so different for me, I, um, I gave myself the challenge of communicating what I was saying in my raps in a different way, in a way that included more people to the conversation and allowed people to access the ideas or maybe even inspired other MCs to include new ideas in what they were saying. So, um, when, yeah, when I got here, I decided to rap without music. I remember attending events like right here, this time, what about eight, eight years ago? Attending events and feeling like, I don't know, I'm going to rap in front of these people and not just look stereotypical or not be misunderstood or not look like some novelty that, that didn't really have any substance to him. So I took it upon myself to start delivering my raps in a conversational style. And one of the first big challenges for me, or not big challenges, but big opportunities was a friend of mine, when I got here, my friend was already president of the African Caribbean Society. And he was like to me, oh, you have to perform at this event. And I, for about three weeks, I resisted him. I was like, I'm not doing it. But because he knew me as a rapper, he, he just wouldn't let up. He said, you have to, con you, you, you're just going to be here. You're, you're not going to give yourself. You're not going to represent where you're from in this, this place. And that pricked my conscience a little bit. So I agreed to do it, but I told him on the condition that I'm not going to use any music. He was doubtful. He didn't know how that would pan out but it went really well. And shortly after that, so in King's, there are, um, there's, there's a student union. There's a, there are student unions for each college. So there were elections coming up for the new committee, right? I applied for the role of chairman. I don't know why. I, I, I just, I was like, that looks like something I can't do. So let me try and see if, if I can. And, um, I just had the idea, so we had to do these campaigns basically. We had to let people know what we were about, what our priorities were, and why we were the person to vote for. And everyone did like formal speeches. Oh yes, in 1850 when that guy did this and said that speech, that inspired me to da da da. But I just came and I just did a poem. And I won by a landslide, hands down. But um, that inspired me, that made me think, you know what, there are different things that we can do with, this, with these words. And ever since then, I'm, I'll be real with you guys, it's the, it started here. It started, much as I love to say it started in the hood. I started rapping in that environment, but the idea of elaborating what I could do with, the, with, with my words started right here. Since then, I started um, talking more academically about the things and the cycles that I saw in my community. I, I stopped trying to meet guys halfway in ignorance. I stopped watering down my vocabulary. I just started talking directly as I wanted. 
with the, with the skills that I developed from being an MC. And people started to understand and recognize. Now that was new. I wasn't used to being understood. I was used to being celebrated and maybe respected in my peer group, but I'd never been outside of the ends and just been talking to other people about rap or rapping with other people and having them understand more about where I was from. So I was here and I started uploading poems to YouTube. One of my first poems was, was called Powerless. Now something for you lot to understand yeah. when I got here, when I got here I was really angry, which I didn't know. I was angry like, come on, your friends are getting stabbed at 14 years old, you, like, you're going to be angry. You know, people are dying, police are getting away with all sorts that isn't really understood in the media. I was angry. I didn't know I was angry though. So when I started writing it, it was coming out subconsciously. My first big poem, Powerless, the first line was, when I make it, you'll never see my face again. I hate the ends. I feel like the owner of Gucci working in H&M. Right? That's how angry I was. I like, like, to where I, I started drawing on like arrogance and, you know, a bit of an attitude to, to, to make myself feel better about all the losses, all the L's that we took in our environment. And someone over here, it, it took someone, a, a student here, to come up to me and say to me, yo, are you, are you sure that that's the message? Are you sure that that's what you want to be saying with the opportunity that you've been given to represent here? And I didn't really take it well. I was like, you're not from my area. You don't know what I'm talking about, man. Trust me, I, if you were there, you would get it. But it made me think about my position. Because, for the, like I said, for the first time, people outside of my friendship group were actually listening to me. They were actually digesting my ideas. And that alerted me to a new level of responsibility. So from there, again, that was a turning point in my writing. And that made me a bit more deliberate in the, in the things I chose to say and how I presented some of my raw emotions. So I really grew up and I started honing my craft while I was here. That was over like a two year period. These times I'm, I was going back and forth, London, all over the country actually, doing shows with different universities, not getting any money, losing money if anything. And um, yeah, so fast forward to the point that I just told you about. Just before I'm graduating, I'm doing my, one of my first headline shows. A lot of things have come together all at once just got the finals out of the way. But I'd been so active up to that point that when I turned up to my final exams, people were like, well, you still go here. <laughs> You're gonna do the exam, yeah, Are you sure? I didn't see you in lectures. But um, everything went well. Everything came together and I didn't have that plan. I didn't know things would. I didn't know how, how much of myself I would discover in this space. Now, an interesting thing happened when I, when I graduated. I went straight back into the heart of the community and I reconnected with all of my friends who were selling drugs, who had been in and out of jail, who were now young parents, who were immersed in very toxic conflicts in our area in which lives had been lost. I was reconnecting with those guys and I rediscovered I, it's like I was a child again because we were learning each other all over again. Just like reception when you're first in school, can I be your friend kind of thing. I was relearning the environment because I'd had some incubation time over here. Now I'm not guaranteeing that that will be the experience for you guys if you choose to come to this place. right? I don't know, everyone's, everyone's different, everyone's an individual. But I know that for me, I recently wrote in, one of, in, in a lyric, that I actually recorded in Church Road with, <laughs> with some, some gangsters. Like, um, when I went to Cambridge, I look back at my community through binoculars and I could see it for what it is. That, that wouldn't have been possible if I stayed in the environment. I would have become either consumed by my anger or completely disconnected with the, with the social setup, with the social scene. 
I don't want to become too... To this day, that there are considerations I have to make. I'm thinking of putting together a new online series and there are two rappers that I really want to get on it. But there's such, there's such bad blood between them two. One of them was connected with a gang that was responsible for the death of the other one's big brother. So it's really hard. Like As a 27-year-old man, I'm still having to navigate the, the rules of the, of the streets. But being here gave me the space to look at it objectively and apply some of the disciplines of sociology, of, of humanities, of the social sciences to what I saw growing up. It gave me that language. And what I found is when I went back to that environment, everyone understood. No one looked at me funny because I'd gone to Cambridge. No one thought, you know, I was a new or a different person. First of all, everyone was happy for me having had that time out. Secondly, everyone was grateful for me being able to articulate what we were all going through in a space like this with the discipline and the exposure that Cambridge gave me. So that was a big thing for me when I graduated and I reconnected with the community. And then, like I told you, I got, I got signed. I got signed to Universal Music shortly after graduation. And um, that was, a, that, I always call that my second university because I came into that situation so full of fire. Like, you know, everyone knew that I was all about the community and addressing all of this unaddressed trauma that we'd been through. And everyone in the music industry crowded around me making those noises. Yeah, this is important for the community and the opportunity that we have for society and all of these different buzzwords that they knew that I would react to. So I, I, I got signed on that basis. I was like, yeah, I'm going to bring the Cambridge, I'm going to bring the hood and everyone's going to understand new ways of talking about crime and education and opportunity. That's, that was my passion. But I quickly learned that that wasn't workable given the setup of the industry. And fortunately, it didn't take me too long to figure that out because of, one, because of a lot of what I studied here. I remember one of my last papers in, um, in third year was, was called Media, Culture and Society. And I literally studied the, 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 the music industry, how music labels started, why they were started, the, di the direction that they evolved in, all the different rules that are operative within that space, not just music, but media in general, communications, culture, all of that stuff like directly spoke to what I was studying here and what I had, what I had actually lived and what I went on to try and achieve in that space. So fortunately, because I was able to, to break down what was happening, I was able to also have a very grown up conversations with the chairman of Universal Music, with the president of Island Records, and just say to them, yo, I don't think this is working. I think we've got different ideas of success. Now, for a lot of artists trying to negotiate their way out of the music industry, it can be difficult because a lot of the time it's about money or the actual music made. But fortunately, because of the preparation time that I had when I was here, I had a lot of time to think about my ideas, my position in the world, the service, the needs of my community. Because I had that incubation period here, I wasn't caught up on money conversations or music or stuff that I saw as short term. And they recognised, they, they, they look in my eyes and they knew that. So it, was e it wasn't hard for me to just detach myself from the music industry without some difficult legal struggles or anything. And since then, that was all 2015, three years ago. Since then, I've been able to just move into different areas. I recently opened the Royal Wedding coverage. I recently, I was on Question Time, had songs with Georgia Smith and Maverick Sabre earlier this year. Yeah, yeah, come on, I'm, I'm wavy. Don't <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm playing. That's, that's not what really happens in my head, but I thought it would make you laugh because I didn't know if you were getting bored. But um, no, seriously, having that time to get my mind right in this space prepared me to go and make a social contribution in the big wide world. And that is what I wish for each and every one of us. I'm looking in your faces thinking, 10 years time, you're going to be like, what, like what, what breaks my heart in my community, yeah? Sometimes I'll just be outside the barbershop, for example, beautiful day like this, 
watching young people pass, run joke, talking about whatever. And I'm thinking, one of you lot might not be here by the end of the year. No cancer diagnosis, no, 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 no conflict zones. You don't, you don't live in a, you know, in, in, in a place that is associated with warfare. But someone might take your life by the end of the year because it keeps happening. It gives me hope to look into you guys' faces and know that you've consciously brought yourself, brought yourself to this space, to know that you're thinking about your future and to anticipate your future. I'm looking forward to seeing you guys in 10 years, to you saying to me, oh, remember that time in Kings and I was there? Because you will be someone, Whatever you, wherever you choose to go, you will be of consequence. I anticipate that, I look forward to that. And if anything, what I want you to get from here, from seeing me in this situation, is that you're next. You're definitely next. Thank you, that's my opening statement. Thank you. But I'd like, to, I'd like to hear from you guys. Yeah, go, go yeah, ahead. I just want to say thank you for that. Um, now the floor's open for any questions, yeah? Yeah, man. That's good. Um, yeah, cool. Can you give us an example of the poetry or raps? Some of my poetry or raps. Let me, let me give you a little sample, yeah? Every now and then, I go to prisons. I talk to the guys about socialism, our own conditions, how we're supposed to fix them. So a couple of weeks ago, I had to go to Brixton. The man them asked me what I think of rap. I said, there's music and politics and we ain't supposed to mix them. People think my issues with spitting, it isn't. It's that spitting didn't stop you from sitting in prison. And that seems odd to me. Rap's a commodity. It's gotta be the best thing adapted from poverty. So if so many men have seen a payout, why aren't their communities guaranteed a way out? The man then took a second to ruminate. And I felt like I started a true debate. So I was getting ready to adjudicate because I love seeing young people communicate. And then one man broke the silence. He said, you see when I rap, I'm not promoting violence, but I talk about the hood to motivate the younger G's under me that are holding weight. People just get offended because they don't relate. A little sample, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Thank you. But, that, but that, that's, a, that's a perfect example. That's a true, that's literal. That, like I was in HMP Brixton and we were having this conversation. And because I had this time in Cambridge to sit down and think about the limitations of rap music, the needs of the community, the paradox of this multi billion dollar industry not necessarily translating into value and development for the, for the very people that create this. And also being in the music industry and seeing firsthand how our talent is manipulated. Manipulated. Because I had the language and the time to think about these things, going and performing that in jail, it's not hard. It's, it's just an extension of who I am. And that's what I would, want, that's what I would wish on any of you, to, to come out of this academic process ready to, to present yourself to the world as you naturally are. Yeah. Any other questions? Got a question at the back? Yeah, but a lot of your public come up was whilst you were still a student here. Yep. I wanted to ask you, how did you balance poetry? I mean, I'm mm. telling you that to turn down some big deals, et cetera, et cetera, around the time of exams. But how did you balance the time here? Because here it's different than any other uni, so it's super clear. Yeah. Poetry. How did you actually balance it? So that's a, that's a very important question. So as, as you said, while I was here, I was working very hard at a very high level in, um, in entertainment to try and generate opportunities, really. Um, and it was, it, was, it was difficult. It was intense. The reason it was intense was because I don't do things by halves, unfortunately. And that sounds great, but it's crazy. It's insane to be at an institution like this, yeah, with the expectation of not failing, 
and B, for example, in, in, in 2013, Formula One called me out to do a, a, like a poem, just like what I performed for you guys, yeah? A little poem about the Monaco Grand Prix. So I had to, like, and this was in May 2013. This was, in, this was just at the beginning of my finals. Um, one, of, one of my old supervisors, Pavis, is here. She, she must be just cringing at the thought of this, right? But, um, yeah, um, uh, just before um, my exams, I've flown out to Monaco. I've downloaded all this information about the history of the Monaco Grand Prix, dating back to the early 20th century. And I'm talking about all the, the, the machinery and the cars and the races and the wins and the losses and the dramas. And I'm supposed to be learning, revising the political economy of capitalism. <laughs> but not only did it create new like paths in my thinking, things that my synapses could now do that I, didn't, I couldn't do before. It, um, it grew me as a person. And it wasn't, I wasn't crazy with it. So for example, in that same week, I was given the opportunity to do an, a, an advert for Nike and they offered me 21,000 pounds. Like 20, that, I, I hadn't made that much money at that point in my life. And um, I didn't know how, like, I, I didn't plan on turning it down. But knowing that I was in Monaco, I was going to come back on Tuesday. So that was like over the weekend. And on Tuesday, I was going to have to do my first exam. I just said no. So I was entertaining and engaging with the different opportunities around me. But I still had a sense of perspective. I, didn't, I, like, I, I had respect for Cambridge, for the fact that I was here. For like, it, it, it meant a lot to not only me personally, but my family as well. So... Hard decisions had to be made, and it was hard. It, was, it wasn't fun. It wasn't all... Like, I, I, you know, there was a lot of stress involved. It was worth it, man. Yeah. Sure. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about the process of application, because I think it would be interesting for... Yeah. But that's, that's a, this is a very worthwhile conversation. My personal experience, yeah, when I was in ULOT's position, my school organized for my year to have a day like this. Anyone who's interested in, 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 in coming to Cambridge, you can just come and see what it's like. You had to put your name down. I put my name down because I was interested. And um, I remember, I'll never forget, I was in a politics lesson and my head of year walked in with the paper of all the names and he called me out in front of everyone. He said, George, you... You said that you, you're interested in going to Cambridge. I said, yeah. He said, well, you know the average number of A stars. Do you lot, did you lot have nines? A's, eights and nines, one to nine system. A mix of some, okay, cool. I was A star, right? He said, the average number is nine A stars. You do not have nine A stars. You shouldn't, you shouldn't waste your time effectively, is what he said to me. Yeah. And um, I went away and I thought about it, I was really embarrassed apart from being like hurt. And um, I didn't talk to my mum about it. I was just like, okay, forget Cambridge, it's not gonna happen. And then my mum started poking around. She's like, yeah, what's happening with your application? Uh, I was like, I, I, I listed all the universities she noticed that Cambridge was missing. And um, if, if it wasn't for her rage, <laughs> <laughs> at how that conversation went down, I guarantee I wouldn't be here. But what, so what, what then happened, I, I explained to her what my head of year said. She, um, you know, she, she met with him. Um, words were exchanged. <laughs> and what we ultimately felt was that we didn't have his support. He, he was kind of like, oh, do what you want to do, but don't say I didn't tell you. So we moved forward without his support. Now, what that meant was that we had to educate ourselves on the process. We had, to find, we had to find out about the deadlines for application. Obviously, Cambridge having a different deadline, UCAS deadline than other universities. We had to find out about what was, you know, we had to find other people that went to Cambridge and ask them what their process was like. We found out about the I had to do something like a thinking skills assessment or a critical skills test. I found out that there were two interviews for my course. 
I found out what the course, I didn't even know, I said I just wanted to do sociology. There was no pure sociology subject at Cambridge at the time. I didn't know what college, I didn't know what King's College was. I didn't even know, really know what Cambridge was. I thought it was next door to Oxford. <laughs> <laughs> this 18 years old, you know, like I didn't, I didn't know anything. But, um, or maybe 17. But my point being, um, I found myself in that process. Me and my mum didn't even see eye to eye throughout that. She was, you know, I, I was resisting. I felt insecure. I felt embarrassed. I felt pressured. I was scared of rejection. But I got my head in the game. I decided to commit to at least going through the motions, understanding when I had to, in, you know, send forward an essay that I'd written uh, previously, an essay I'm proud of. Then um, December 10th, I think, I, I, I was offered a, an interview opportunity. Did two interviews, very, very, very like surprising. They were like, they, they flowed naturally. I was able to just, again, talk according to who I am. I talked about the fact I was a rapper. I talked about the hood. I talked about music, Obama at the time. Then I talked a little bit about Margaret Thatcher, a bit about Hitler. Stuff like people. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't trying to indirect. But I, you know, I was talking about things that I felt and connected with. And that process was so organic. And then, yeah, got the application, got the admission acceptance letter shortly afterwards. So the process might be a lot more intimidating and might be a lot more painful in your imagination than it is in practice. Go ahead. So I love the way you talk about your time in the university. It's almost like it was like key to who you are now, and like key to like your life as a poet. Um, I find that a lot of people here find extrovert almost at odds with their life in Cambridge. You think like you come to Cambridge just for your degree and that's it. What advice would you give to people who are struggling to maybe like do other stuff apart from their degree but find that maybe it might be wrong? Yeah. Okay. So this is something that I learned painfully. Yeah. When I was because in, in the school that I went to, like I said, I was a rapper throughout that time. And the school kind of frowned on it. The school was not supportive. So I entered Cambridge with that same mentality. I thought, yeah, if they know what I really am interested in, they won't support it. So I ended up separating the two. I was going out to go and perform. I didn't do as many performances in the, in the university, right? But... I realised, especially, look, look, being here right now, I realised that if you can, if you are genuine, if you are really exploring parts of yourself in your ext extracurricular activity, whether that's athletics or a form of public speaking or, a, or Warcraft, is it, what was that thing called? Warhammer, right? Whatever your interest is, if that is genuinely who you are, Cambridge is a place where you need to explore that. Like you, you need to contribute that to, 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 the, to, the, to the life here because they probably haven't seen you before. You've got a unique, like, you, like if you think about your fingerprint, that's, it's not replicable. It's, it, like your fingerprint doesn't occur anywhere else in the world. And that is like an, a metaphor for who you are. So I would advise that you find a way to make your extracurricular interest speak to your life here. Keep it in conversation. Don't separate it. It will, it will become easier. People, you'll, you'll be walking through campus and people will be like, oh, how's the painting going? How's the, how's the Warhammer going? Because they associate you with that interest and it just, it helps. It, it really does help. You'll, it, you, your brain will figure all of these things out, all the connections, naturally. Yeah, man. for the future. Yeah, because, well, okay, so my questions come from a different place. Obviously, I know you, and um, I know a lot of your work. You know what I'm saying? And the content that you produce, I feel a lot of it goes over people's heads. You know that as well. Even the book, Search Party, etc., etc. Like, you have a lot of theories and answers to things. Do you know what I'm saying? So I'm yeah. like, are you going to go into politics? Yeah. Are you going to 
influence politics from outside? Do you know? Are mm. you just running with it to see what I want? Yeah, man. I'm glad you asked. So for me, it's about education. Everything that I'm doing in the space of entertainment, I'm trying to reinvest that in the education process. So there are a lot of young people that will never make it to this room because just because of different barriers up to that point. Like I said, discouraging teachers or even discouraging unsupportive parents or a poor relationship with the written language. Like you see words and that's just intimidating, even though you have all of these capabilities inside of you. So I'm very interested in those people, especially because, you know, a lot of the people that I grew up with, I saw them branch off outside of academia and get into trouble, but also find a lot of wisdom in trouble. They found all of this. So I'm very interested in how we can bridge that gap, all of the knowledge that exists in society that is just out there, all of the experience that contributes to people becoming, you know, to people becoming functional in society. I really want to be able to connect these kinds of academic spaces with maybe young people that might engage with that experience in a criminal context or not even criminal, just, just outside of the, the context of opportunity. So the reason I'm very like, sometimes my, my poetry is very academic or it sounds like I'm working my way towards a PhD in a lot of what I write is because now that I've got an audience, like, we, we need to generate some new opportunities. Like, I can't, how can I just be... Recently, I got into a, de a debate about Kanye, yeah? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> And um, Kanye's album was dropping, and everyone was like, oh, yeah, what do we expect? And I was like, I, I, I expect absolutely nothing. Because Kanye's had, like, like rappers... That, the function of music, of the music industry, is to sell music. It, it's, not, it, it's not there for much more, right? So Kanye recently came out with controversial statements about slavery, about Donald Trump. And my thing was like, you have an album coming. You're saying that because you've got an album. Like, maybe you feel like that, but you're saying it right now because you have an album coming. And that was what I was scared of for myself when I was in, in Island Records. I was like, I'm, I'm eventually going to be bound by financial incentives, by the economic model of this whole industry. Because I've got to sell records. That's what my survival will depend on. So if that's how it works, then I'm going to have to follow the market as opposed to follow my intuition or follow my intelligence or follow my line of inquiry. So I've, forci I, I, I've forcibly tried to carve a career in which my ideas are the driving force behind my engagement with, with, with society, as opposed to just the need, oh yeah, summer's coming up, we need songs out, oh, but the kids ain't gonna listen if there's too many words. Nah, like, you got to evolve the, the space if you really wanna have higher conversations. And for me, education is fertile ground for doing that, because that's where people are, re like, schools and prison. That's where people listen to me the most, I'm telling you. Yeah, and obviously we don't want the prison thing. Hi, I'm just curious, um, what book or journal or article changed your perspective the most while you were sitting here? So there's a, there's a few books that Im impacted me. One was called The Dialectic of Enlightenment by Horkheim, Horkheimer and Adorno. That book was about um, a lot of what I just mentioned actually. And I, I, I referenced it in a, in, a, in a poem. I've forgotten what it's about. No, 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 I, haven't, I haven't forgotten, but ultimately it's about the relationship between the market and the, 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 you know, cult your cultural contribution. So what, the reason that book was so interesting for me is because it was quite a hard look at my role as a rapper or as, a, as, a, as an artist, as opposed to me you know, gassing myself up and saying, you know, I'm, I'm for the people. It's, it's like, no, exactly what I just outlined to you, the, the, the logic of capital. What, what is going to happen if you are in this business model? And it forced me to think very, this is what I mean about having that time in Cambridge to think about these things. I thought really creatively about what I would do if I had that platform 
And while I was thinking that, subconsciously I was building that platform. And, you know, you attract the opportunities according to what your, what your interests are. So getting signed shortly after graduating gave me the opportunity to test out these different theories. So the dialectic, the dialectic of enlightenment was a, was a big book for me, amongst others. Yeah. No, I'm just saying, if there are not any more questions, obviously, because we're spec over the time that you have here. Um, so, oh. uh, do you still listen to drill and grind music? And uh, do you respect that rappers who still do drugs and stuff? Yeah, so first of all, I respect everyone. That's like, I know that sounds like, uh, yeah, cool, but that's a very important starting point because if you don't respect people, you, you start telling yourself stories about them. You don't listen to their own story. Do you get what I'm saying? So just earlier today, I think I checked Teddy One's new song. I wasn't really feeling it. But I, do ch I, 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 like, I listen to everyone because everyone's telling you things about themselves. So, for example, j Haas just got nicked for carrying a knife. j Haas got stabbed in, in, in 2015. And I know that because I engage with his music and I, like, I love his album. I'm aware of who he is and what his story is. So I'm able to put the news of him getting arrested in its social context. I'm able to interpret it through his lens as opposed to just going to the mainstream outlets that are automatically going to just say knife crime, drill music, criminality, bad. And again, that was a process that I was only able to really appreciate like reasoning that way happened because I was in Cambridge like I said if I didn't get that time away from my community I wouldn't think like this I would see Jay House getting arrested and, 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 and just think to myself yeah I bet sure of course right so yeah respect for everyone's perspective is, is very very important and being in a place like this not only engaging with other people that are also very passionate about what they're studying and what they've experienced but also committing yourself to academic discipline, just analysing things academically, it will help you think outside of your own emotions. Um, like in our kind of area where we go to school, um, there is like a bunch of people that don't really see it the way that you're explaining it to us. And it is a bit difficult, like um, not too long ago we were doing this UCAS thing, and they asked me, oh, what do you want to do? And I couldn't even let anyone else to speak. Like, and then someone else said, oh, she wants to be a medical doctor. And like, a bunch of people started laughing as if it was something like that was frowned upon or something like that. And how do you deal with the anger that you have towards the community's idea of things? Yeah. Or like even speaking properly, like mm. speaking right or whatever. Mm. So how do you deal with the anger that you have with them? because of how the mindset of our community is so narrow. Yeah. So two things helped. Creative expression, just getting it off my chest and allowing myself to experience these emotions and education, constantly inquiring, constantly interrogating the experience, thinking why, why would we laugh at that? Like, for example, asking yourself, how many doctors did come from this community? What doctors do I know? And why is that the case? Asking these questions will help you figure, will help you position these experiences, again, outside of your personal emotion. Because ultimately, it's part, it speaks to a much bigger issue in society. And what you probably can't, or may not, what I couldn't appreciate when I was a little younger was that youth, is, is a very limited experience. It's, it's varied, there's a lot going on, but time, the passage of time will make you look at all of that very differently. Like when you, when you tell, if I was in that position, I, I, would, I can imagine myself being hurt and, and a little bit angry, but now I, I'm sad. I hear that and I'm, I'm sad for, for anyone that would laugh at that. But that's because I'm a little bit older and I've got like nephews and I want them to, f I want things for them and I can see youth in a different way. Like I said, when I'm sitting outside the barbershop watching these young people, I'm like, rah, you guys are, you guys might not be here. That, that breaks my heart, like in a way that it didn't when I was younger because that was all I knew.
So yeah, give it time. Give yourself room to express yourself in whatever way you can. And don't stop asking those questions. Bear, question, bear, please. With the rise of knife crime in London, especially, and how um, some jewel rappers have been banned for promoting violence, do you think that this idea of violence and um, rap and drill will always be connected? And how can this sort of anger in the communities be redirected? I think it's worth, again, positioning what is being said in the music within its social context. So guys are dying on the streets and a lot of these guys are scared. They're scared, like that's how it was when I was younger. We was all scared. So you start entertaining thoughts that you, 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 you wouldn't have entertained before this started to enter your social life. Now, as long as that is a situation on the ground, it's gonna play out in the music. Now, that's, uh, that's not a pass. We have to do something about it I would, have, I would rather if the community was, was taking a more holistic approach to, con to, to, you know, to chairing the conversation as opposed to the police just doing what the police do. They, they enforce. That's what the police do. The police is not a sociological body. So, but again, I know that understandings, understanding society a little bit better now. However, yeah, my answer to that would be as long as the situation in the streets is as volatile as it is, as long as people feel locked out or alienated from opportunity, and as long as people don't have the, the means to articulate what they're going through, this situation is going to continue. And I see it as my job to, to, to stop that. No matter what I did, what sorry? You've made your overall change in your community. Yeah. How did you pass that Yeah, so I've felt like that for the majority of the past five years. And it's been it's been difficult, but like I said, the the same advice I give to you is what I follow myself. Interrogation. Just don't stop asking these questions. So people, people say to me a lot nowadays, where, where, where did you go? You were quiet for a couple of years. And that's because every time I made a song, every time I wrote a poem, I would look at it, it would sound nice. People around me would say, that's great, when are we releasing it? And I would just trash it because I knew deep down exactly what you said. It's not gonna impact. It's not gonna structurally transform. So because I kept reaching that same conclusion, I, I thought about structural transformation a bit more. I started imagining outside of what I can see. I started imagining, right, imagine if, if, uh, if drill music was on the curriculum. Imagine if uh, pupil referral units were spaces in which young people could talk about the streets and explore the streets from an academic um, discipline. So because I started imagining these things, I realised that I can just feed that into the music. I can feed that into my commentary and I can bring people around. Again, I can chair that conversation as opposed to me feeling like I have to work within the confines of the rules that have been set by generations of rappers and musicians and other people that own media spaces. Those people are not me. It's my, it's my fingerprint. I need to make sure that my mark reflects exactly what, what I'm interested in. So because I'm now on that journey, there's no end to that. There's no cut-off point where I feel like, oh, one more young person has been lost on these streets, therefore I should now quit. I know people that feel like that because they've given themselves to this struggle for years and they feel spent. I don't. I feel young. I feel like I'm going to do this for the rest of my life. So I don't, as long as it takes, I'm, 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 I'm prepared. Please. My biggest role model, that's a good question. Um, Malcolm X is a big inspiration for me because he changed his, he allowed himself to change his mind through inquiry. So first of all, when he was in jail and he, um, you know, found, found, found change in the nation of Islam. I'm not, I'm not religious and, you know, I, I don't agree with a lot of what the nation of Islam is about. However, I, I appreciate that he grew through that change. And then when he went, uh, uh, when he went to, uh, on his pilgrimage, 
to Mecca. Again, he departed from what he'd been indoctrinated with in the nation of Islam and he was always un uncompromisingly vocal about his thought process, even if it meant sometimes he might have to change course or apologise or, you know, make mistakes. He, 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 he tried. And that's a big, Tupac's a big inspiration for me. Lauren Hill is a big inspiration for me. Um, Beyonce is a massive, and Jay-Z is a massive inspiration for me. So a lot of cultural figures. And when I was younger, I was embarrassed. I thought like, I've got to say someone academic. I've got to say like an, some big, deep author or some. No, these are the people that I was engaging with when I was younger. And it's helped me figure out where I am positioned in the world and who I would like to be, what I would like people to take from my presence. Please. How do you deal with people expecting you or encouraging you to settle for less? It's a great question. <laughs> you see that blank space? I just didn't acknowledge it. That's why I'm racking my brains. Like, you, you, you expect less from me. But that's, that's, that's happening inside of you. Inside me, there's a whole carnival of expectation. So it's, it's an effort for me to step out of this carnival and get into your dead space where nothing's going on. <laughs> Do you get me? So please, just, just fill yourself with the right energy, man. Please. No, sorry, there's a question at the back. Okay, so, so, <laughs> so I grew up, yeah, um, in fact the school that I went to was a grammar school and it was predominantly Indian. Minority of, of, of students were black. So I thought I understood race politics. The way we dealt with a lot of our ignorance about each other, we made jokes, very inappropriate jokes, all the time, yeah. But it helped, we were kids, it helped us break down and learn about each other and grow together. When I came here, that was the first time I understood what it meant to be an ethnic minority. Growing up in London, especially like our parts of London, we didn't know that. So that was an education for me. It was an education for me to like be in conversation with someone at like a party and then the next morning they just don't acknowledge me. That was, that was new. It was an education to sometimes be, you know, trying to get access to a college and not, you know, ha have to over explain the fact that I am a student and whatnot. But the way I see it, I'm on the forefront of change here. So I'm gonna have to, yeah, I'm gonna have to take that hit. My, my, my parents came here from, from Uganda in the 80s. They had to educate a lot of people in, in how to talk to them and how to deal with them. And I'm a beneficiary of that education, of that process. So again, and it's about awareness. It's about just understanding the history of these different societies and understanding the opportunity that you have in contributing to that and not taking things personally. That's one thing that my mom always tried to make me understand because when I was younger, I wasn't like that. I would run into fights. I would run into confrontation, but a lot of the time, people's experience or people's personal feelings and issues feed into how they deal with you and it's just not, it's just not personal. Did you um, ever feel like trapped in a stereotype? For example, like, um, given that I live in a really nice area but I go to school in a really, like, bad area but, um, even though I go back there every single day, I'm still, come, I'm still seen as that person. Yeah. So, I yeah. was all like trapped in a stereotype because I'm like, I have to do this because yeah. I'm this. Yeah. In school, that was a big thing. But again, I relished the opportunity to teach people. So, when I became a rapper, my vocabulary didn't change. And that's one thing that people always used to say, oh, George likes the big words. And they liked it. Or th and that, that, was on, that was at home. But in school, I was kind of a mediator. I was someone that spoke with everyone. So a lot of the time when different groups weren't getting on, I was able to, to build bridges because I was multilingual in that respect. So it, it all depends. Like there are two sides to, to the coin of stereotype, profiling and disadvantage. The, 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 the flip side is that they actually don't know what to expect about, every, about your uniqueness. They, they just don't know. 
Sure. I'm sorry, guys. I'm going to miss my train if I don't. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I wish you all the best. And uh, like I said, you guys are next. You guys are next. So start thinking creatively. Start thinking very imaginatively about how you'll be remembered about how everything that you've been through, all of your unique experiences, will inform what you share with the world. I'm excited. Thank you very much.